Lucas Sims bouncing back is a key part of the Reds surprising all expectations this year, hopefully. How he is working toward that goal and how the Reds are different this season are all things that we talk with him about on today's Locked On Reds. You are Locked On Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Reds. Thanks for making Locked On Reds your first listen of the day. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and we are free and available on all podcasting platforms i'm your host steven offenbaker alongside jeff carr and we are diehard baseball fans we have a passion for the cincinnati reds we have taken our love for the game our passion for baseball and we have turned that passion into information for you on today's podcast we are joined by reds relief pitcher lucas sims he's going to talk to us about his rehab how much work he's been putting in he's going to dig into the bullpen he's going to talk about the outlook for the team in 2023 and tell you why you shouldn't be sleeping on this cincinnati reds team uh, jeff and i will come back after the interview and we're going to get you caught up on all of yesterday's action out in the cactus league because don't look now folks but the cincinnati reds They've won four games in a row, and there is a whole lot to be excited about. So, Jeff, without further ado, let's get into this conversation with the one and only Lucas Sims. Uh, we are happy to have you with us here today, Lucas. Um, when it comes to how you're kind of moving through spring training and how you've been moving through uh, your recovery from last year, uh, how would you how would you kind of characterize that? Uh, it's just been a been a long process um there's been a lot of uh testing patients and um but it's um it's been pretty good so far it was definitely challenging one of the one of the harder things that i've done in my career um just a lot of obstacles and um really kind of testing your patience but um i feel great and um it feels really good to be back out there when it comes to like a back injury like that i know that you know, there's, there's all myriad of different stuff that you have to do for each and every injury, but back injury has got to be so frustrating because it's not just like, you know, this will help you get to, you know, point from point A to point B. Um, how has that differed from other, other maybe ailments that you've worked through during your career? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it was just being able to, it was tough. It was <laughs> It sure. was um, it was just a roller coaster of there was some good days and bad days and some really bad days and um, you know ultimately we tried everything we could um, to kind of fix the fix it without surgery and it just kind of got to the point of it, it was it was impossible um, so we ultimately kind of made the decision um, to go ahead and and get it handled with, um, with the hopes that it would not come back. Um, so that was, that was kind of, it was a tough decision, but it, we, we tried everything we could and, um, but it's, we fixed it and put it behind us and ready for 23. So all that being said, you missed a significant amount of time. This was a long process. And as you say, a challenging process, walk me through, uh, that first trip to the mound back in spring training this year, you know, it had to be a little, it had to hit you a little bit different than a normal spring training game. Yeah. Just, um, even, even really the live VPs, um, just getting back out there. It's, it's the intensity ramps up, um, you know, and then you're not on a, a backfield anymore. There's, there's people in the stands. Um, there's the buzz and the energy and you know, it, it had been a while. Um, it's, it's different than, you know, throwing the last pitch in September, October, and then going back, back out for spring. You know, I, I don't think I, I hadn't faced a hitter since uh, May of last year. Um, and definitely, you know, hands down, the, the longest I've ever taken um, without facing a hitter. And then after that, um, the longest time I'd ever really taken off a playing catch. Um, so that was, it was a rush of emotions. And a lot of excitement, a lot of, a little bit of anxiety. Um, but it was 
once once you get it rolling, it, it's kind of like riding a bike, and um, it's kind of one of the more comfortable places for me is 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 up on the mountain. So you're coming back now to a a game that is making changes. There's these new rules. There's time involved. Uh, all of the pitchers in baseball are having to do things just a little bit different as far as uh, their routines with the timing. Uh, I guess I'll preface it with with this question. Do you consider yourself to have been or are you uh, what gets phrased as a maximum effort pitcher? Do you feel like you're one of those guys that people are talking about when they say that? Um, I think everybody's honestly <laughs> maximum effort. Um, I don't know if necessarily would classify it as. Um, I guess so. I guess you could. I guess you could say that. So I ask that because now with the new timing rules, plus coming back from injury. So there's a lot of moving parts here, right? You know, you're trying to get comfortable again. You're trying to get back into your game, but you're also having to work within this new set of rules. Uh, how have those rules impacted you as far as the timing goes and the ability to pitch and be the type of pitcher that you want to be? I like it um, personally because I think um, generally I've throughout my career, uh, I've done better when I kind of just get the ball and go. Um, even going back to my starter days, um, you know, it's just – it's just on to the next thing, and, and it just kind of keeps me in rhythm. Um, personally, for me, I think it's – I like it for myself. Um, it doesn't really bother me, and there's actually some hidden advantages um, that I think that, that pitchers will have that um, I don't think a lot of people were really expecting. But um, I've always pretty been comfortable holding runners on as well, so it, it really doesn't bother me. But I know some people are – it's a little bit more of an adjustment, but, but for me, um, I, I think it's only going to help me. I just get the ball and go and try and be on the attack. And uh, the shorter I can be out there generally, especially as a reliever, think we'll, uh, better things are happening. Do you think we'll see more things like Verlander pulled the other day where he just came set and, and held the, the set Scherzer. until the hitter oh, – was that Scherzer? Sorry, Scherzer, I thought it was yeah. Verlander. It was Scherzer. I was, I was just basically um, just – fired as soon as the guy steps into the box right so it, my understanding is that the the hitter has to be a, alert like they you can't just um in the game yesterday i think uh will myers was hitting off of one of the rogers the the submariner and i i think he quick pitched him and the umpire stopped it um there was no penalty involved but he just basically told him you, you can't do that um, I don't know. I, I'm not necessarily in, I don't know. I, I don't know. There's, there's still a lot of experimenting, I guess that can be done. Um, now that I've got a couple games under my belt, maybe, maybe we could see, um, see how that plays. But, uh, ultimately I think it's been going pretty well. So coming into this spring training, it was, it was kind of a theme. I know David Bell talked about it throughout the off season at the winter meetings and stuff like that is that he wanted the team to feel cohesive because he felt like last season with all of the trades and with the shortened spring training, they just you guys never really got a chance to kind of get that cohesion you get in a typical spring training. How has the locker room felt? Like what's the difference in it this spring training as opposed to last year? I, th I think I think David's done a really good job of, of trying to just incorporate some things um, not only on the, on the field and, and preparing together, but um, just trying to bring guys together with um, some meetings and, and, you know, some, some fun stuff that uh, gets guys together and um, you get to kind of know somebody. And I, I think that that really helps um, go a long way as far as building a team. And, and um, you know, you see a lot of really great teams there uh you know they're really close out on the field but but also you know they're they're friends off the field as well and so um you know i, I think just building that relationship and getting to know um, getting to know each other getting to know your teammates and kind of what makes them tick i think it, that builds a lot of chemistry um when you when you step out on the um, step out on the field i think that it's it's big and i know david is is a big proponent on that and um you know I, i'm really excited to get this thing rolling 
If you're a Red Skeptic, Lucas Sims has an answer for you. Coming up next, he's going to tell us exactly what he would tell those who are doubting the Reds this season. Before we get into that, though, I want to let you know that today's podcast is brought to you by FanDuel. FanDuel is the official sportsbook of Locked On, and you know, we are like three weeks away from opening day. I am absolutely pumped about this, and FanDuel is the perfect companion with you in baseball season. Download the FanDuel app today and head on over to FanDuel.com slash locked on to check out the no sweat first bet of up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Plus, there's a long shot bet out there that uh, you might want to take a look because if it hits, and if Christian Encarnacion Strand continues to hit, you'll put a few bucks in your pocket at the end of the season. CES is 55 to 1 to win the NL Rookie of the Year. And with every passing day, that seems a little bit more interesting. So don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet of up to $1,000 in bonus bets back when you go to fandle.com slash locked on. That's fandle.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with Fandle. They're the official sports book of Locked On. And now that sports betting is legalized in the state of Ohio, we have the perfect podcast to help you put some bucks in your pocket. That's Locked On Bets. It's just like Locked On Reds. It's free and available on all platforms, and you can get the expert analysis of Lee Sterling from Paramount Sports as he gives you the best bets of the day. Coming up tomorrow, people are getting it twisted with Tyler Stevenson, and we're going to set them straight on another Aloha Friday live edition of the podcast. That's at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. We hope you join us, and we hope you bring your thoughts into the comments section. All right, let's jump back into the conversation with Lucas Sims. What's been your favorite? I know that he's he's kind of done between the three-point contest and the, the Reds got talent type stuff. Like, what, What's been your favorite one of those to be a part of? I'm a big proponent of Reds got talent. Uh, I hadn't shot a basketball in quite a long time, but, um, it, it's probably, I'm just now starting to get my voice back from, um, from the hooping and the hollering, but, but I, I love Red's Got Talent. I'm a big proponent of that. Did you do a number for Red's Got Talent? Was there a, a Lucas Sims edition that we didn't see on social media? No, no, those are, um, those days were past. Those are, these are for the young guys to kind of come in and, and open up and, um, it's, it's a fun way of, um, you kind of let your guard down a little bit and, and, um, you go out there and you just try and have fun. Um, you know, put some effort into it. That's a big thing. And if not guys like myself will let you know, <laughs> but it was fun. We, we, we had a, we had a fun time. Yeah. I love, I love seeing Alejo Lopez and his performance, but also Joey as well. It was, it was cool to see everybody kind of coming together and stuff and, and, and hearing all these different reports, because obviously for, for one reason or another, there's lots of Reds country that is skeptical about the team. And, and while we can see the path forward and we see how the team can really improve this season, there's still some folks that are, are doubtful about it. What would you say kind of, being in the locker room and being a part of the team, what would you say to a skeptic of somebody that's just like, yeah, I don't know. I don't see the Reds getting better this year, man. I'll tell you what, just being around and seeing some of the talent that's around, um, you know, last year being hurt, I, I didn't get this, I didn't, wasn't really around as much. I kind of did my rehab in the morning and, you know, I was able to watch the games and, you know, like you kind of mentioned earlier, there was a lot of turnover and a, and a lot of, a lot of moving parts and a lot of injuries and, um, but I, I think with our group that, that, you know, we're not, we're not ignorant to the fact that a lot of people are pretty skeptical of, um, and, and pretty open up about their expectations, but, but, you know, we got a, a clubhouse full of guys right now in camp that, um, we're there to win and, um, there's a lot of talent in there. And I think if we really put it all together and, um, I think we really can surprise some people and I, and I genuinely, um, believe that yeah, I got a I got a little bit of controversy started up on the wonderful social media when I was uh, optimistic about the outlook of this team this year so 
I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys bring out onto the field because and, and you hey, mentioned everybody like starts the, oh, everybody starts oh no exactly exactly and an opening day I mean hey you know I I, I really think and. You know, I, I, there's going to be a lot of new faces on this team this year when you're talking about the Christian Encarnacion strands and the Ellie De La Cruz's that, you know, we'll, we'll probably see at some point. But when it comes to the the group that you're a part of, the, the bullpen, it's been, you know, a, a unit that has seen a lot of turnover in the last few years. And you've been one of the constants that have remained. Like, how do you view this year's group? especially with, you know, the emergence of Alexis Diaz last season and, and Buck Farmer. I, I really do believe that that really can be a, a strength of our team. Um, like I said, with the, with the talent that we have, um, I, I think, you know, knock on wood, you know, hopefully we all avoid the injury bug, but yeah. when we get healthy and, and get healthier um get guys like tony and, and tj back in there um you know i really do believe that it can be a uh, a big strength for us you know there's been some reports uh, but not very specific reports that the reds are doing some things differently in regards to training and conditioning and, and trying to keep players healthy you know obviously last year they set a record for number of players that had to be used in a season are you seeing differences as far as the training and medical staff and the the way that the reds are handling players to try and you know help that along a little bit as far as keeping everybody healthy and not burning through so many players this year I, I can really only speak for myself. Um, I know that uh, I, I got a lot of my plate uh, in just regards of kind of trying to keep myself out there. So um, I, I got nothing but but great things to say about our staff. You know, they're they're in their long hours. They work really hard. They're they're very educated, and um, you know, they've they've helped me out a lot. Um, I'm very thankful for them and and what they've done for me during my rehab process and. Um, you know, trying to keep guys out there. I know that, you know, they definitely don't want to see guys on the injured list. We want to, we want to keep everybody out there and healthy and, and playing. And, um, but uh, I, I've been really happy so far. One last question, uh, Lucas, and I know it's been, it's kind of been one of those things that folks have bandied about a little bit because Alexis Diaz, his brother, Edwin has that crazy intro and all that other stuff. Uh, if you were to kind of create your own intro, what would it be like? Create my own intro? Yeah. Uh, like make my own song or? Or just have like, you know, like is everybody going to line up from the bullpen and like, you know, hold their hold their gloves up as you run through or I don't know, you know, something, some sort of epic intro to bring you to the mound. Uh, or I've been kind of contemplating my own, maybe not epic intro, Um there's been some funny ones through the I guess, TV and stuff like that. But um, I used to, when I was in high school, middle school, I guess high school, growing up in Atlanta, I got to see uh, Kimbrel's intro hmm. with the Braves. And it was, I always thought it was super sick. The, the whole stadium goes up in flames and yeah. the, the screech of Welcome to the Jungle starts playing. And that was, that was always kind of, um, I always think of that. One. I think that would be sick. But, um, I don't know. I, I, I'm thinking of a, thinking of a few things maybe for this year, maybe uh, maybe a little the Who, Bob O'Reilly, a little ode to uh, George Bulldogs. That's always a pre pre song for them. A kickoff in Sanford, back to back national champs. Um, thinking about maybe using that one. Don't tell him he's an Ohio State guy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Go Bearcats. Um, but uh, yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. And I, I love the, the different intros. Welcome to the jungle would have a special place in Cincinnati fans hearts. That's for sure. Uh, I, I can't use that. That was, like I said, that, that one's taken, <laughs> um, in, in my eyes that that's almost second to enter Sandman and then hell's bells. That's, it's kind of spoken for, I think Getting it is retired, a sick intro yeah. though. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, definitely. 
All right. We had such a great time talking with Lucas Sims. It is just uh, so exciting. And we're so grateful for him uh, taking some time during spring training to sit down and talk with us to share information with you. Uh, I can't wait to see him striking out guys for real and just a little over three weeks at Great American Ballpark when the Reds open the season against the Pittsburgh Pirates. Cannot wait. Uh, speaking of watching the Reds win games, the Reds have won four of them in a row out in Goodyear, and there are a ton of young players still murdering the baseball, and it's not just the youngsters now. Uh, we're going to tell you who's done what and get you completely caught up on what's been happening in Cactus League play. That's coming up next. You can follow the podcast on all platforms, including right here on YouTube. Make sure you click both the notification bell and the subscribe button so that you know every time we drop something new and every time we go live, just like tomorrow when we go live for another Aloha Friday live edition of the show at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. In between shows, you can follow us on Twitter. You can follow me at S. Offenbaker with two Fs. You can follow Jeff at Jeff Carr. That's Jeff with three Fs. There he is. And you can follow the show at Locked on Reds. Jeff, uh, I've got Arizona on my mind right now because I, I said this the other day. I, I've been telling you when we're texting and talking. I said it on the show. Uh, it is really exciting watching Reds baseball right now, even if it's just spring training. I don't recall a time when every time I turned a game on during spring training, I was just excited and had so much fun watching. And there's good reason for that because the Reds beat the Padres to win their fourth Cactus League game in a row. And it's not just the young guys now that are knocking the cover off the baseball. And we got to start first and foremost with the man who, let's face it, nobody's got to see on their chest, so we're not calling him a captain, but one of the leaders, if not the leader of this team, and in Jonathan India, one for three with another double. That's three doubles in two days. He had two doubles the day before, and he had a double uh, against the Padres as well. Double machine. You gotta love seeing that. Well, you know, and I think that's getting back to the player that he was during his rookie of the year campaign. And that's the player that he's talked about getting back to when he's talked about the things that he did wrong last year in his preparation and the things we were robbed of by all of the injuries. You know, he isn't a guy that's going to hit 40 home runs, but he does have the ability to drive the ball into the gaps and use his speed on the bases to get you that double, to stretch it to the occasional triple. And it really looks to me in these at bats, the last couple games, that he has found his swing. Uh, if if he's in if he's in the batter's box and he is comfortable and he's hitting the ball into the alleys, uh, he's going to put the Reds in a position to score a lot of runs by uh, starting things out. I think he's your leadoff guy. Uh, if he's yeah. getting you doubles, that's going to be a great opportunity for the guys coming behind him to pick up the RBIs and put runs on the board for this young pitching staff. Another guy who's showing out is. A guy that I'm not sure is going to be here all season long, but could really benefit from the confines, the friendly confines, if you're a hitter, of Great American Ballpark, as John Sadak said, and that's Will Myers. Oh, yeah. You know, Sadak uh, talked about how Will Myers uh, seems to be a player built for Great American Ballpark. Uh, he went two for three in this game against the Padres yesterday, Jeff. He's hitting 389 on the spring. And I'm looking forward to how he hits at Great American Ballpark. I think 81 games of this guy is going to be some decent offensive numbers, whether he's filling in at first base or playing one of the corner outfield positions or an occasional designated hitter spot. And like we've said with him, he's not really a platoon split guy. We don't have to worry about, well, you put a righty in against this right-handed hitter and he's not going to be able to touch him. That's not Will Myers. He is able to kind of play to whatever pitch is thrown to him. I think that... Reds fans are going to gravitate toward him, and, we, and we've seen it so far in spring training. We're going to be able to gravitate toward this guy because he just takes what the pitcher gives him, and I think that you know, for all the different guys that we've seen come through the system the last few years, that's going to be a lot of fun. Absolutely. And, you know, those are a couple guys with uh, a significant amount of major league experience. Now, uh, Will Meyer certainly has more than Jonathan India, but, you know, Jonathan India is no longer the fresh faced kid. You know, he's in heading into year three now. So uh, the Wiley vet. 
three. Right? The <laughs> the youth movement on this team, though, is something to really be excited about. And whether we're talking about the front half of the spring training game or the back half, uh, the, the young players in the games are just providing electricity. Uh, we'll start with a guy that's playing a lot of the front halves of games and having a lot of success, and that is Spencer Steer. You know, you were all in on Spencer Steer. You were doing your year of the steer, whatever rhymey thing you were doing before things got underway and i made fun of you and darn if you weren't correct the year of steer is here the talent's clear ready to go because i've got that 25 to 1 line there on fanduel for him to win rookie of the year he's going to play every day like it's going to be mostly at third base he might get some exposure over at some other positions depending on who gets called up what injury situations are and, and different things like that because like we've said before, like whenever he talked to you last season for a lefty in the bullpen, he mentioned he likes to move around. But it's just the way this roster is working out right now that third base is his, especially with the Reds making the moves that they did this offseason. He is going to be able to play every day. And so far, like we can kind of point to some guys that we were hoping would, you know, show out a little bit more in spring to this point. He is a guy that is showing out and is absolutely giving us nothing but confidence in handing him that everyday third base job. I'd be interested to see, and this will be something that I believe we'll start kind of talking about next week, but as far as an optimal opening day lineup, I kind of wonder where he slots in, but I think that he's going to be pretty valuable wherever you put him. Yeah, we're almost in uh, make our lineup seasons, and that's always a fun time. I, I yeah. can't wait. But yeah, Spencer Steer has has done has not done anything that makes me worried about running him out there at third base to start the season. Know. He plays the position well. Uh, he's looked good in the batter's box. I think that there will come a time at some point in this season where moves will necessitate him moving around a little bit. And I'm okay with him being a utility guy as long as it's the super utility full-time playing guy. If he can play every position on the field every day for all I care, as long as he's out there playing every day. Uh, the next guy I want to talk about, and I'll listen, Jeff, I'm going to need you to take a breath. I'm going to need you to settle down. Let me get through the opening line of this, and then I'll turn you loose. But Will Benson Woo! continues <laughs> to impress. <laughs> he's hitting a cool, crisp, 500 on the spring during his time with the reds he's playing a very competent center field he looks good out there he looks like a guy that can field the position uh, he looks like a guy at least against right-handing pitchers uh is going to be able to deliver in the batter's box and i know that um for you uh, that's what you've been saying all along See, I'm trying to see Amer uh, National League Rookie of the Year. I'm still not seeing odds on him, but I can't wait to see odds on him because I'm going to throw money at that because Will Benson, he's going to be Rookie of the Year eligible. He's not, he, you know, he only played just a smidge for the Guardians last year, so he's definitely still rookie eligible, but he's showing everything. And something that I love, and, and kind of t throwing back to what John Sadak said uh, when he got the chance to talk with you the other day, is that he's talking about that he just has an easy leadership about him. I mean, he is a dude that I want to see as much as possible this season. If he can hold his own against left-handed pitching, that is a big win for the Reds. Because, again, we still don't know what's going to happen with Nick Senzel, who is allegedly going to be the right-handed component of some kind of platoon out there. Seen we him have yet. no idea. We haven't seen him. So uh, I, I, if Will Benson can figure out how to hit lefties with some form of respectability, uh, that's a big, big win for the Reds. And listen, you talk about Will Benson. You know, He's just an intelligent dude. And I'm not just talking about baseball smarts. He is hmm. just a genuinely smart guy guy you know he he plays chess with joey Votto. he is you know very educated very articulate guy and i think that he's going to put in the work necessary to put himself in a position to be the everyday guy i think uh more than anyone else right now he can see the writing on the wall yeah and um kind of looking at these next two guys i i'm gonna ask it this way because both guys you know they got a hit yesterday and they continue to have spring training numbers that just absolutely jump off the page at you, who is most likely to be on the opening day roster between Matt McClain or Christian Encarnacion Strand? 
Well, I'm, this is probably not the answer. This is probably the answer you expect from me, but the listeners probably don't expect this from me. But I'm going to say Matt McClain uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, as far as the Red Scouting Department is concerned, uh, they've had Matt McClain on the cusp for a little over a season now. Uh, what we're seeing from him out in Goodyear would seem to reinforce that. Uh, I do have some pause, a little concern, uh, just saying that Matt McClain is ready for prime time simply because we don't know how he'll do against the everyday uh, top-notch talent of Major League Baseball. He's been coming into a lot of games later in the games, uh, you know, after the fifth inning when a lot of the starters have exited already. I'm, I'm interested to see how he continues to progress uh, if he gets some opportunities in the front half of that. A lot of what I just said about Matt McClain can also be be applied to CES. Uh, although he has started a few games, he's shown some power. Uh, he's shown some baseball smart, stretching doubles into triples, uh, hitting for uh, hitting home runs. So uh, all those things being said, though, I think Matt McClain started this spring training a little bit closer. So if one of those guys and only one of those guys could go, I would say it's Matt McClain. It's just interesting to me because I'm seeing more and more uh, coming out from Bobby Nightingale, from C. Trent, from Mark Sheldon, talking about the possibility of CES being on the roster. And normally, those guys are not talking about, you know, we, we, we like to talk about prospects who can make the opening day roster because it's a lot of fun. It's, you know, it's, this roster is more fun with these guys on the opening day roster. But when the guys who are closest to the team, the guys who have the access are talking about him, that leads me to believe that there's at least some thought to it. And if he can continue, I mean, I don't know that I'm going to say he hits 600 all spring, but if he keeps hitting the way that he's hitting, I think it's going to be almost criminal to put him in AAA at that point. So I'd, I find that very intriguing myself. I'm, I would love to see CES on the opening day roster, especially because it certainly looks like Joey Votto is not going to be there. And if they can find playing time for all of them, Take them all for all. I mean, really, I'm just yeah. ready to see these guys every day. They're so exciting. It, it, it's just been so much fun, Jeff. Uh, I, I'm certainly not saying it's got to be uh, one or the other. I, I would take them both if they can find consistent playing time for them uh, once they call them up. I agree. But I know I know that that is where we're going to wrap up today's edition of the Lockdown Reds podcast. Thank you all so much for checking us out, and thanks for listening in. Coming up tomorrow, people are getting it twisted, Steve. With Tyler Stevenson talking about two rosters. No, we got it. We got to set the record straight here. That's happening tomorrow for another Aloha Friday live edition of the podcast. Make sure you join us at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time and come ready for question with questions and comments as we are going to talk Reds with you at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. Now. For your second lesson, check out Locked On Fantasy Baseball. Win your league by listening to Matt and Dom every day as they bring you the best fantasy draft strategies. Find Locked On Fantasy Baseball wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Steve, lots of rumblings going on. The Reds are on a winning streak. Lucas Sims is looking like the guy who could be our bullpen ace number two. What's it mean for you and me? That means, as always, we are going to continue to be locked in on the rumors, locked in on the waiver wire, locked in on the transactions to report back right here and keep everyone locked on Reds every single day. You know, I think my intro song would be ACDC Shoot the Thrill.